Okay, so Catherine uh, basically mentioned almost everything uh, about this, uh, about the layout. Let me just mention a few things to, to make sure you don't do. Avoid jargon and abbreviations, especially for the age page, because it just reduces the impact, especially if people don't understand what those abbreviations are. Again, simple declarative sentences. You might have been an English major in college, but it doesn't matter. You just want simple, basic writing so someone can grasp it really, really easily. Um, I'm not going to put this in because uh, this is exactly what Catherine went over. One thing I can mention, though, that, um, that you should, again, things to avoid. Avoid dense, hard to read writing. I've, had, I've seen people in their three games actually put potential pitfalls of the. It's like this is a salesmanship part. This is why you want people to start thinking about why this is a good idea in your study. You don't want the reviewer to already start thinking about weaknesses of your research. So don't put in weaknesses of your research in that. Again, avoid criticizing other people's work. It's fine to talk about gaps of knowledge. It's not fine to talk about that John Smith's work was fatally flawed because what if John Smith is reviewing your grant? Um, and again, as we said, one aim that depends on another. Um, again, for things to do, make sure that your research will address your hypothesis. This is really important that people outside your field read your specific aims. So, um, for example, my wife is a rheumatologist. I have her read my specific aims page because then I figure if she can understand it, then I'm sure that, and, and she's obviously a smart woman, but then I, I figure that someone who's in my field can probably understand this too. Oh, the one thing that I've also seen with the aims page um, that, that wasn't mentioned is um, in grants where there's necessarily at least some abbreviations, if there's enough room, sometimes on the AIDS page, I've put a line across the bottom and then a list of abbreviations. And so that then if they want to remember what did you, that abbreviation meant, even if you think it's something that someone ought to know, they can go back and look, look on the AIM page and see the abbreviations. So if you have enough room and you have a lot of abbreviations in your grant, it's not a bad idea to put an abbreviation list there. Because I've suddenly read grants where they put in some abbreviations and I forgot what it was, and I had to go paging through their grant to try to find out what does you know A B C D mean. So if you put it all at the bottom of your aims page, that could sometimes be helpful. So the final thing is, of course, the rebuttal letter. Um, in my experience, on the study section I serve on, almost no R O ones, even if they're from senior senior investigators, get funded the first time. And certainly, my own R ones almost never get funded the first time. So you will almost always have to write the rebuttal letter, also called the introduction. So um, this is a, uh, a, uh, a, a, a based on work from uh, Kumar Ross, who did this, this incredible research on what do people go through when one of their loved ones dies, right? And so they start with stability and immobilization, anger, and so forth. Well, when you've spent four months writing your grant and you find out it doesn't get funded, you tend to go through the exact same process. So here's the key thing. Do not write your book <laughs> when you're in the anger point. So we all feel anger. We always, of course, think that it's nothing that we did. It's just that the, we just had idiots for reviewers, right? But if you write that in your introduction, you can be almost sure your grant will not get funded, OK? So you don't want to write it in that point. You want to wait till you get to the acceptance phase. Because the thing that, to remember is, for most study sections, when you send your grant back in, it will probably be read by probably at least two or three different reviewers. Okay, And so this is another reason why, as Bill mentioned, you don't want to piss off the SRO. The SRO is the person, the senior uh, what is it, scientific research uh, organizer, officer. That person is the one who assigns reviewers to your grant. And if, let's say, your previous version of a grant got a bad score and you called up that person and yelled at him and unloaded on him or her, uh, he or she can make sure that the most critical reviewer is the primary reviewer of your grant when you send it in next time. So you do not want to shoot the messenger. Um, and the other thing is, is even if your grant goes to a totally different study section, they will have access to the critiques and if, if the critiques, and they think the critiques are reasonable, and you just say, oh, this was stupid, they're not going to believe that, and they're going to say, well, I think those are legitimate critiques, and they'll, you know, so we're going to have to address it. But, so this is what you do when you find out your grant doesn't get what appears to be a fundamental score. 
contact the program officer. And again, as, as uh, Carol mentioned, you always do it by telephone because they'll tell you a lot more things by phone than they will in email. Uh, don't shoot the messenger. Remember, the program officer is not the one who, who rated your grant. The program officer, though, was at the study section, hopefully, and will be able to tell you what was the, what was the tone of the uh, discussion. And he or she can hopefully really emphasize what were the weaknesses that the uh, study section was concerned about. Read the summary statement really closely, especially the resume and summary discussion, and look for common themes that you can address. Um, so there's some common fixable problems. One, of course, is poor writing, um, insufficient information or experimental detail or preliminary data. The data issue can be a problem because sometimes you're going to basically need to do the grant in order to generate the preliminary data, but, but hopefully not. A weak premise, uh, very, very common um, from what I've seen. People just don't do a deep enough dive in the literature, and that's easily fixable. Approach uh, shown, not shown to be feasible, but the applicant can actually demonstrate it. And then, of course, insufficient discussion of potential problems and alternative approaches. In my experience, this is a very, very common problem. Now, there are ones that are tougher. One is philosophical issues, like the reviewers believe the work is not significant. If that's the case, and it's just like, yes, yes, it is. No, it's not. It's pretty hard to fix that one. Um, hypotheses are not sound or, or supported by the data presented. Uh, the work's already been done. And sometimes, you, you know, you see grants where they actually before they sent the grant in, um, but, but between the time the grant was submitted and the time you reviewed it, a seminal paper comes out that actually answers the grant. And you know this happens sometimes. And the proposed method is not suitable for testing the hypothesis. And poor investigator environment score, those are really, really hard to fix. But hopefully being at UCLA, um, the environment score won't be much of a problem. But it certainly can be for certain labs. So you have one page to write what's called the introduction. Um, and so basically, um, this is where you can answer, hopefully, the critiques. So the one key thing is you briefly summarize a major criticism. Remember, a lot of grants are all about spin. So um, because you don't have much time or much space, you don't want to actually write out verbatim what the critiques are. So what I do is I, I always um, frame them in the most positive light. In other words, you don't want to say the reviewers felt that we were unqualified to do the proposed work. Instead, you say the reviewers felt that additional expertise and statistical analysis would strengthen the project. Right? So you don't want to make, it, make yourself sound bad. And so I always try to frame these in the most positive light possible and also, of course, using the least amount of space. Remember again, as I mentioned, some of the reviewers will read the revised version. And so, uh, and a, a, group, a review criterion is, was the revised grant responsive to the previous review, okay? So make, if they suggest changes, if they seem reasonable, do it. But on the other hand, sometimes a, uh, a reviewer will suggest that you make changes that are actually wrong. And I've seen grants, and I've had it happen myself, where you get whipsawed, where you actually respond to what reviewer one says. You send the grant in, and they said, oh, it's a shame, because reviewer one, let's say, didn't like aim three. And then you basically get another review saying, it's a shame they didn't do, plan to do X, and that was what was in your aim three. So just because a reviewer says you ought to do it, doesn't mean you should do it. But you should take their comments very, very seriously. But if you think that do whatever they expect is a bad idea because, let's say, it's not feasible or it's going to open a whole can of worms, you should then comment on respectfully why you don't think that's a good idea. So um, also be polite. This is a quote from a grant I reviewed. The reviewer is just plain wrong. And um, obviously, uh, that grant did not get a fundable score when it was reviewed. <laughs> Whereas clearly, if you disagree, you can say things like, we respectively disagree. And again, remember the viewpoint of the reviewer, that you're going to probably get that same person reviewing your grant. So um, try, instead of being defensive, try to keep the point positive. Uh, the, in fact, frankly, I sometimes say, if they say you know, what I think is a really good point, I'll actually say, the viewer makes the excellent point back. Because face it, then if you were reading it, they'd say, oh, good, they thought I made a good point. <laughs> right? And so that probably is positive. And of course, try to convey commitment and excitement by hopefully presenting additional data or new publication. 
And again, even if you think you've written it in a nice manner, you should have someone else read it to make sure it doesn't sound antagonistic or angry because that's very, very common and you don't want that sort of feeling to seep through. So um, again, the final thoughts then is you really want your grant to be the best possible. So by maximizing your preliminary data and publications, again, have other people read it, especially people who are not in your own lab, but outside of your group, if you possibly can. Uh, right now, though, uh, here's another thought, is after one resubmission, you're allowed to, you cannot resubmit the grant with the same title, but you can then resubmit it as a, with a different title. Now, the resubmission for the second time will not have an introduction. But that being said, the reviewers reading it may well still be the ones who didn't give it a good score on the, the um, first resubmission. So although you don't specifically write, have an introduction where you respond to the critiques, you should respond to the critiques basically in the body of the grant by making the changes that they suggest. So another sort of final thing is let's just say um, when you've sent in your, your grant that um, in three different times or two different times, the reviewers really liked AIM-1 but didn't like AIMs 2 or 3. Um, it's certainly feasible to then just take AIM-1 as sort of a, a, a consolation prize and turn it into an R21. Face it, you've already written the grant, you've already written the preliminary data, uh, and just make it in an R21. And sure, an R21 has much less money than an R01, but at least you're going to get some money out of it. So rather than abandoning the project completely, if it's clear that the reviewers really like one of the games, and it just seems like you can't get the, the full R01 over the mark, is at least try cutting out one of the games and sending in it as an R21. Just as a, a question to that, uh, we haven't talked about R21 very much today. Uh, are R21s usually... Uh, well, you can use. I mean, this is where I think the basic science and the uh, clinical ones are might be a little bit different. Most basic science grants that I read typically only have two aims, and maybe two and possibly three. But typically, within each aim, there's a couple different sub aims. So typically, if you're going to aim one, you would just make sub aim one aim one of your R21 and sub aim two R2 uh, aim two. So typically, that's what you can end up doing. Obviously, if you have an integrated grant that's tightly integrated and you can't take an aim out, then, then you're going to have trouble. But sort of with basic science, it's usually easy to, pretty easy to break it up into to subgrants if you do. I mean, my general experience is, is you know, the question becomes, should we get an R21 on an R01? The money and the time for an R01 are way, way better than an R21. Um, and the other thing is, is at least at the NIAID, which is who I do my uh, of grant evaluation for, it's just about as hard to get an R21 as it is to get an R01. And so my advice to everybody is try for the R01 first. On the other hand, if you have a really narrow project that you or you can't get the R01 funded, an R21 is certainly better than nothing. And I personally don't write R03s. Because the application for an R03 is exactly the same as for an R21 in terms of page length. And my feeling is, is hopefully everyone can be creative enough to figure out enough research to, to, that would take $225,000 versus research that would only take $100,000. So my feeling is if you're going to write the seven page grant, which is what it is for an R21, I would, or and an R03, I would always go for the R21 and figure out a way to spend that money. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess that's it.